Um, great to see everyone. And yes, um, so the Committee for Racial Justice is convening a housing committee. So it'll be fo focused on racial justice in the context of housing. Um, so we've had already two meetings and we've actually already um, had two advocacy opportunities. Um, we have um, submitted a, a letter and commentary at city council regarding the housing element. And we also submitted a letter of support for AB 721, which is a restrictive covenant bill. Um, so we're off out of the gates, you know, um, we really want to take action. We want to make change. Um, so if you're interested in being part of the committee, we're just forming, we would love to have more participation participation. Um, so I will drop my contact info in the chat for anyone who'd like to join. Thanks so much. Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Angela Scott. Um, one of the and I'm speaking on terms of our education. So I'm giving you an education update. As many of you know, um, the city of Malibu has pressed forward with their um, intention. They've, you know, unilaterally decided to move forward with this petition to the county um, to separate. They're calling it a unification, but it's actually a separate from our Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. And as a result, um, if we're going, if we're following the plan that they have, uh, that they want to push forward, um, then we're looking at a disparaging uh, separation that uh, economically will really hinder our student, uh, you know, our students as far as the funding that they will receive and ultimately even um, cause a number of, um, you know, job losses for our staff. And, um, and and there's a lot of, and I could, if you're interested, I can send you uh, what we have so far, as far as just various information that the school district has released, as well as other uh, articles and stuff that even the city of, of Malibu has uh, entered. But having said all that, this Saturday at April set on April 17th, there's going to be a public hearing before the Los Angeles County, uh, County Committee on School District Organization. It starts at 9 a.m. and it's going to be a virtual hearing. So we, we would ask that if who have um, who have students or you know family members that are in this district to um, to attend the meeting and even uh, speak up in the meeting you know, talk about um, this inequity because that's what it's really gonna amount to at the end of the day, when you talk about a, um, uh, the demographics that are involved in this whole school, you know, the school breakdown itself. If you look at, um, at even how our school district, yes, you know, we, um, we share our taxes at this time, but again, the breakdown in it, and it's not just about the money, it is about the students and what happens when we do separate and you think about the minority students who attend Malibu, maybe because their family, you know, their parents work in Malibu, what's going to happen to them? Are they still going to be allowed to attend the school and what type of support is going to be with those students? So we're looking deeper into that and, and what happens there, especially since we know that there's still issues that are occurring. And I say issues uh, involving racism that is still occurring in that area and we're trying to address that but this uh this quote unquote unification divorce is only going to make those matters worse so we're looking at all of that and we just ask you to please plan on attending uh this upcoming saturday at 9 a.m to this public hearing and um like i said i can forward you information if you're interested put your emails in the chat and just list education and add your email and i will forward you um, information from the school district on an, just simple FAQs involved in the separation. Thank you. And from that, I will hand it off to Joanne. No, you were going to hand it off to Mark. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mark, yes. <laughs> Take it away, Mark. Okay, well, thanks, Angela. And it, it's always great to be uh, among this group. So thanks uh, uh, for having me here. Uh, so Angela asked me to give an update on a an ordinance that's coming before the city council on Tuesday, and that's an emergency ordinance uh, regarding um, police powers uh, during protests. So uh, I'll, it's kind of, there's a lot going on with this. So let me try to unpack it without taking up a lot of time. Number one, um, the police department met with a number of groups this past week to outline a very detailed plan um, 
after the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. There's a lot of concern that there will be protests around the country and particularly here that may uh, get out of control and the police have, have a number of plans in place to address that, including um, you know, no leave for their officers, extra training, uh, uh, a plan to, to close entry points in and out of the city and uh, improved intelligence gatherings and a, a number of other things. But this emergency ordinance tactically, uh, and it has been uh, developed as we understand it between the police department and, and the uh, city attorney's office, gives the police additional tools that are outlined in this, in this ordinance as um, uh, allowing people to engage in expressive activities, in other words, protests without fears of violence and injury. Um, there are some issues and a number of people have brought forward about this ordinance. Uh, and I'll just go through them uh, very quickly because it could be a long list. Certainly what it does it, it very carefully details what cannot be carried by protesters down to the size of the stick that someone can carry, a long list of items that can be confiscated by police uh, preemptively, although it leaves fairly silent, unless I miss something, how the process of stopping people, searching people for hidden items and uh, more obviously held items can be done without in fact escalating issues. Um, there is nothing in there about de-escalation. There is nothing in there uh, that might be learned from an after action report about police tactics at uh, May 31st last year that could be applied um, here. As a matter of fact, the uh, emergency nature of the ordinance does not allow for, uh, it pre in effect preempts the OIR report and even preempts in certain ways, in certain timing, the full operation of the police oversight commission established to be established also Tuesday night with people named uh, by um, the city council. So I say all this, you can find a lot of uh, the, the full uh, text of this ordinance and how it aims to protect civil liberties may, but may and, and avoid violence, but may actually do just the opposite. Um, and may actually undermine the, the, the council's, in terms of timing, the council's will that preceded it. So I won't go into more detail, just one last point. Um, my friend, George Brown, uh, who was on the original public safety committee, uh, sent a letter to city council members that he shared with me that I think puts a very interesting lens on this proposed emergency ordinance. And what he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing him and, uh, what he basically says is that built into this and the emergency nature of it is the presumption that the African-American community of Santa Monica will hold an out of control protest. That rather than having some kind of, planning some kind of event that might discuss, uh, bear witness uh, to the verdict, whatever it might be, it assumes the worst outcome and does not seize the moment to use this as a time for healing in this community almost a year after May 31, as opposed to expecting the worst. And that does not say very much in effect about the African-American community of Santa Monica and the other citizens who may or may not have participated in the May 31 events or May 31 peaceful protest and certainly have concerns about how we go forward in the current environment na uh, nationally. So um, that's sort of the general outline. It's controversial. People have very strong views on both sides, all sides of this. So I'm not urging a particular point of view, just trying to give you some um, information on what's coming on Tuesday. And I have dropped information. It's just a link to the, um, to the upcoming city council section of the agenda that addresses that. So you guys can check on that link. And then it lists several other cities that were looking at similar ordinances. So that'll that's a fine comparison, if you will, of um, different ordinances that other cities have established as like a, I guess, a litmus test into what we're looking at further. Um, and from there, we will now move on um, to 
Joe Ann. Yeah. Finally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know we want to get to the speaker, so I just have a, a couple of quick things to say. And that is uh, to just to reinforce what people have been saying about if you're interested in any of these arenas that we work and study in, uh, education issues, criminal justice uh, issues, housing issues, put your name and your uh, email in the chat and indicate which you would like more information on. Because it's very important for the public to speak out on these issues, especially the one Angela talked about. Malibu is going to have a lot, a lot of people there talking about why they need to split from us. So if we can't find, you know, if people aren't willing to come from Santa Monica to try to support opposition to that, it's going to be very unbalanced on um, that hearing on um, April 17th. So think about taking part in that. And uh, also, if you're not on our um, Committee for Racial Justice listserv already, where you get emails about each monthly um, gathering, uh, put your uh, a name and email in the chat and say you want to get, get the monthly email. Um, I also want to say real quickly that our next two uh, months, the dates will be the first Sundays, which is our usual Sunday, and that will be on um, May 2nd and June 6th. We're still working on the May 2nd one, but we know that June 6th, George Gascon will be with us. And um, for those of you who don't know that name too well, he is the relatively new LA County District Attorney who's getting a tremendous amount of pushback for the reforms that he's trying to put in place in the criminal justice system. So that should be a very interesting um, gathering as well. And we um, invite you to come to both of the next uh, two um, workshops that we have. Uh, now, uh, for our speakers tonight, um, as we, uh, each of the, uh, the speakers will be introduced before they speak, and we'll ask you to make little notes to yourself about what questions you have so that you save them until all three people have spoken, and then Robbie will facilitate the uh, Q&A uh, session for us. So I am fortunate, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening. And that is Mayor Sue Himmelrich. Mayor Himmelrich serves as special counsel, also in addition to being mayor, she serves as special counsel litigating cases at the Western Center on Law and Poverty. She attended Harvard University and received her Juris Doctorate from Columbia Law School. This lifelong Democrat has traveled across the country doing voter registration, uh, voter protection, I mean, for former President Barack Obama, Senators John Kerry and Harry Reid, and many others. Her involvement in Santa Monica politics began in 2012, working with the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles to protect longtime residents in Santa Monica's village trailer park who were threatened with evictions to make way for a massive development. She helped residents fight the evictions and enhance relocation benefits for 30 tenants, some of whom had lived there for more than a quarter of a century. That work eventually led to her joining the Santa Monica Planning Commission. Mary Himmelrich has a deep commitment for affordable housing and has worked to uh, adopt Revised zoning code. Joanne froze. Um, so I will continue for a moment until she comes back in to adopt revised zoning codes that emphasize transit oriented mixed use development on our commercial boulevards and in our downtown to ensure that all new multifamily development has 20 to 30% affordable housing. Uh, Mayor Hemmerich says one of her most satisfying issues involvement is a role that she and her husband, Housing Commission Chair Michael Soloff, who's also our guest speaker panelist tonight, uh, played in convincing Santa Monica voters to approve a half cent sales tax increase to provide $16 million per year in new for our schools and for affordable housing with half the revenue for each. 
Within the Santa Monica City Council, Mayor Hemorrhage has introduced new ideas and programs, including creation of an audit subcommittee, registration of lobbyists, public posting of correspondence to the council on agenda items, amendment of the Oaks Initiative to make it enforceable, protections for Section 8 tenants, teachers, students, and displaced tenants, and more. Mayor Hemorrhage, by the way, met her husband, uh, Housing Commission Chair Michael Soloff, in a deposition. Of course, right? <laughs> they married 18 months later and have two daughters together. And now, Mayor Hemorrhage. Um, thank you. And anyone who has questions about my, how Michael and I met, can I ask them in the questions? There are a lot of good stories around that. So uh, in, in any case, I, I really want to uh, thank you all for being here tonight. And I, I want to thank um, the Committee for Racial Justice for having me. Um, for those of you who don't regularly attend CRJ meetings, I do and have been for probably, certainly since I've been on the council, maybe six years. And um, I can tell you that they are, in my view, the most thought provoking substantive meetings I attend in the city of Santa Monica. <clears throat> I think they deserve your attendance and your support in their other activities, which are all admirable. Um, so I am here tonight to talk about, as usual, affordable housing, but for once, I have an opportunity to give you a little framework about why this is such a major issue for me. And uh, <clears throat> when I started, I didn't have a sense across the state, I did have a sense in Santa Monica of how dire the issue of affordable housing was. Um, and, and to give you an idea of how widespread it is, but how complicated it is, I did first uh, become exposed to it in connection with Village Trailer Park. And I sort of learned it in a weekend because the city was proposing uh, seven units of affordable housing in a project that at that time should have had upwards of 70 units. As it was revised over time, we ended up with 40 units, but even that was inadequate. And now I'm gonna put up, and, and I can do this, Louise, by the way, I can do it. It turns out, I see I can do it from my own computer and I'm going to, so, um, or I should be able to. So I came to realize how widespread and how significant this issue was when I went to a Yosemite conference in which uh, H, uh, there were folks from HCD and folks from McKinsey and they put up a graphic very similar to this one. So yes, the HCD, and I apologize for this, but um, I, I think before uh, the time, and, and can you go to the bottom of it, please, Louise? I'm sorry, I can't scroll. So um, if you look at this figure, and this was basically what they showed us at this conference. So in the state of California, we have a, 300 units surplus of units that are above what's required, what you need if you're considered in either moderate or low income categories. But on the other end, and, and it's hard, but you can see there's something like a two and a half to three million unit shortage for people of lower income. And if you scroll to the top, that's more um, that that's more graphic for you. So in Santa Monica, this has been our issue. We make our market rate um, RENA targets um, every time. In other words, we have no trouble producing market rate units. What we do have a problem uh, in doing is creating affordable units. And if you think about area median income, and I'm going to go back a little now. So affordable housing <clears throat> is defined in the state as housing that's affordable to people who are 80% of area median income or below. Area median income for a family of four in LA County and Long Beach um, 
and bear in mind, this is a family of four, $77,000. So that means that half the people in this area make less than that and half the people in this area make more than that. Um, you can see from this chart that we are really failing lower income people in our state. And I contend that we're failing those people in our city as well. And now Louise, if you can put the um, lack of affordability graphic, the one that I had up before, um, up. Well, so in Santa Monica in 1999, so this shows the loss of affordability in Santa Monica. This is from a rent control board report. So in 1998, basically everybody at every income level could find an apartment that they could afford. And what market pressures have done to our city is in 2017, something in the neighborhood of 10% of people could afford the housing that was becoming available on the market because the green line is all for uh, basically above market housing. And this is what has happened to our housing market in Santa Monica. So last week at our city council meeting, we adopted a program that was different than the program that staff proposed. Staff wanted to have a program where the emphasis is on what we call inclusionary housing. In other words, what Angela was talking about, buildings that contain some market and some market rate units and some affordable units, generally in the neighborhood of 80% of the units are market rate and 20% of the units are affordable. Well, you can understand why that doesn't work. But the other thing is that uh, we have, we are aware, and a lot of this goes back to fourth and fifth in Arizona and the project there, but so projects built on public land um, can be built for basically half the cost, <clears throat> excuse me, of projects built on land that we buy. And that's because we already own the land. So all you have to do is build the housing. So what the city council proposed last Tuesday was that we build 6,000 units of affordable housing on city owned land. Now, up until this time, the idea that we could meet these RENA targets was inconceivable because we would have to build 30,000 units or in that neighborhood with inclusionary housing to build the kind of affordable housing the state was requiring of us. But using our own land, we can truly build this housing if we can get monetary contributions from other sources, i.e. the state that's imposing the requirement and pur purportedly is committed to affordable housing um, and our county, which allegedly is committed to affordable housing. So with that money in our land, we can build these units. What they'll look like is a different issue. We don't have to say that. We don't have to say what level they are. But part of what this does is it opens up to people who have creative ideas about creating more affordable housing to create more affordable housing. And this harkens back to a conversation I had with Robbie Jones this morning about building for purchase housing. Right, I understand that this is a big need, particularly in these meetings, and I've been to a lot of them. I understand that people want to own housing. And so this could be possible in this framework if we do it right. But again, I can't come up with all the ideas for building the housing, but I hope to be able to create, create a landscape where we make space to build it and we have a statutory framework to build it. So this is my goal. I think we can stop sharing the screen, Louise. Um, and thank you very much. But my personal goal is to build as much affordable housing as we need, which by the way, I can tell you today uh, that if you look at overburden in Santa Monica, our households are overburdened over 4,000 households are paying more than 30% of their income. And my husband will correct me when he gets on, but I believe 
that it's 4,200 households that are paying more than 30% of their income uh, to rent. And, and let me just say that when you're making less than $70,000 for a family, or this is, would be less than $60,000 for a family of four, you cannot afford to pay more than 30% of your uh, income in rent. Uh, I'm gonna close it up there. I will, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I will take your questions on anything, including what affordable housing really means, but I am gonna yield the floor and, and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Mary Hilmerich. And um, as we said earlier, we will be doing Q and A once everyone is done. Uh, please submit your questions in the chat and then we'll also circle back to you during that time. Um, next, we are going to hear from Housing Commissioner Michael Soloff, and I'm going to give you his introduction real quick. Uh, Michael Soloff is the current chair of the Santa Monica Housing Commission and has served as a member for the past six years. Mr. Soloff is also a co-chair of Santa Monicans for Renters Rights and the vice president for membership of the Santa Monica Democratic Club. Mr. Soloff further is a business litigation partner in the law firm of Munger, Tolls, and Olson, LLP and for the past 15 years has devoted about 20% of his time to providing free legal representation to low income tenants and tenants rights organization. Mr. Soloff has received awards for his tenants right work from the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, the Legal Services Corporation, the California State Bar, Bet Tezek Legal Services, Public Council, and the Daily Journal Corporation. While serving on the Housing Commission, Mr. Soloff has advocated for increased funding for affordable housing programs, increased affordable housing requirements in new developments, dedication of city-owned land to affordable housing, creation and expansion of the Preserve Our Diversity written subsidy program, greater transparency in the expenditure of affordable housing funds, a public planning process for the expenditure, I'm sorry, expenditure of affordable housing funds and greater emphasis on cost effectiveness in the expenditure of affordable housing funds and full implementation of the city's affordable housing preferences for those who live or work in Santa Monica. Mr. Soloff has played a leading role in the successful campaign to pass measures GS and GSH, which increase the local tax to fund affordable housing and the public schools. And now we will hear from Housing Commissioner, Mr. Michael Soloff. Thank you, Angela. And let me just say two things. It's an honor to speak at CRJ. I have that honor once before. And I also want you to know that um, what Sue says, she says about CRJ is true. I have been hearing it every uh, Sunday, once a month, <laughs> that this is the most important organization in the city. Um, and she learns the most there. So it's not just what she says to you. It's what she, she really believes. So let me see if I can share my screen and I'm going to talk about what I think is the most important thing that we need to try and accomplish in the city with respect to housing. And that is we have to find a way to provide housing that's affordable to our low income residents and to our city's lower wage workers. Um, I also want to say, and this is something that's going to be coming up, that I fully support the right of return concept that uh, Council Member McCown, McEwen, excuse me, um, first started that will be coming back to council. Um, and at some point I would like to talk with this organization about the issue of how we layer that preference in as well. That's another reason why we need um, uh, affordable housing in the city. Um, and here's the actual statistics on the issues that Sue was talking about in terms of rent burden. So even prior to COVID, HUD was estimating that more than one in five of every Santa Monica renter households are both low income and pay more than 50% of that income for rent. That's 7,250 Santa Monica renter households. And that makes up more than 96% of all the severely rent burdened households in the city. That's those that pay more than 50%. And 4,200 of those severely rent burdened are extremely low income. That means they're making 30% or less of the, uh, uh, the area median income. So that's like making $25,000 or less and they're paying more than half of that for housing costs, how are they supposed to live? Um, so that, that, that's shameful. Um, and then one in three renter households in the city are both low income and pay more than 30%. So 
So that's in addition to the those who are paying more than 50%, and those are considered rent burden. That's over 10,000 Santa Monica renter households. And that makes up more than 73% of all rent burden households in the city. And we have over 5,000 extremely low income households in the city. That's people making 30% or less, $25,000 or less for a family of four and paying um, at least a third of that, more than a third of that for housing. Again, how are they going to, to live? It, it, it's shameful. And it's something that, that you know I'm sure this group knows, but I think a lot of people in Santa Monica don't realize, and quite frankly, a lot of people uh, in the world that sort of perceive Santa Monica as this rich place where only rich people live. And, and there isn't that. We have a lot of uh, low-income people who are suffering really a lot right now. And these are the ones that are housed. And here's just the actual graphic of the, the statistics that you can see there. One of the things that, that's important here is that that directly is now feeding into the problem of homelessness. Um, you know, sort of in the olden days, people thought of homelessness principally as being driven by, you know, people being released from, uh, uh, you know, um, from institutional settings who might have mental illnesses, drug addictions, things like that, a lot of that. And, and there's still obviously that portion of it. But what we found now, this is again pre-COVID, that um, even though we all voted for Measure H in the county and there's a lot more money flowing in to try and address the homelessness situation and we're housing more people who are unhoused than ever before, and the problem is we're creating more homeless people uh, than ever before and at a faster rate than we can even house people so that the population is growing. And you can see, this is from the Los Angeles County Homeless Count Report, that they're pointing out that, again, this is prior to COVID, that two thirds of the people in, you know, that they were counting in January of 2020 uh, were experiencing homelessness for the first time you know, in the prior year, so in 2019, and almost 60% of them said economic hardship was the cause. And that's not surprising when you have so many low income people um, paying so much of their income for housing, um, you know, that just one slight, even if people can keep that up, one slight problem in their life, you know, interruption, emergency, extra expense, and they can't pay the rent and they end up on the streets. And this is just to point out that the problem is not just in Santa Monica, I mean, this is statewide. Um, and that's important for two reasons. Uh, one, one reason why when we take this advocacy outside of, of Santa Monica, we're making the same points. But the other is that, um, you know, affordable housing um, in this city needs to also go to the many low wage workers who come into our city, our city every day. Uh, we need to address the folks who are here, but we also have an awful lot of people who are working in our restaurants or working in our retail or working in our hotels that are facing these same situations. And those folks are in the industries that provide most of the revenue that all of us who live here enjoy. Um, the services we have are funded a lot by the transit occupancy tax and by the, um, the sales tax. Um, and we wouldn't have any of that revenue if we didn't have these folks. And, you know, it's, it's also shameful that they have to commute for an hour and a half or two hours each way to just to find a place where they can afford to live. We ought to make a place to welcome them into our community so that they can live near to their work and so that their kids can also enjoy the benefits of our, our city, like our public schools. So... What we know doesn't work for this portion of the population is trickle down housing. You know, we can build tons of market rate housing, but that's not going to get us to addressing this core problem. And even the folks who are big advocates of that, this is like McKinsey Global, and you can see they point out that they believe in all of these things to unlock market rate housing. Um, those are all good things um, from their perspective, but it's not going to solve the problem. For lower income people, the only thing that is, is going to be the government intervening and trying to do something to actually help folks. So there are two things that we know really work, both of which the city has done before, and we just need to do a lot more of. Um, one is 
And I'll start with the affordable housing. And it ties to, to the issue that um, Angela raised about Malibu. And I sent her the letter that we sent in from SMER to, the, um, uh, to oppose that petition by Malibu. Um, and one of the points that we make in that letter is, you know, there's a much greater diversity um, in the school system in Santa Monica of the people who live here than there is in, in Malibu. I'm not saying that we look like the rest of LA County, we don't. The high cost of housing here is one of the principal barriers on the entire west side of Los Angeles um, to anybody coming here. And because of the historic effects of systemic racism and the like, it disproportionately affects people of color. Um, but um, as the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights pointed out in the, um, in the report that it did for the city on affirmatively furthering fair housing, this city has done more than any other actor in West Los Angeles to try and combat that. And part of that has been um, uh, its commitment to affordable housing, which has included a lot of money uh, that people have put in here. Public land has been used before. Um, you know, CCSM has been an incredibly important part of that. We have Tara here, and I think we have Patricia here tonight who's on their board. Um, and actually the majority of the affordable housing on the West side, or most of it, it's not even just a majority, most of the affordable housing on the West side of Los Angeles is already in the city. Um, but fortunately the people here I think are committed to doing more. Um, and uh, it's expensive, but as Sue said, you know, uh, if the, the city council is serious that we're gonna commit our public land to that, that covers a lot of the cost and it's, and, it's, and it's a cost that's, you know, indexed against inflation. Even if we can't build it all next year, um, you know, the price of land is not gonna be going down in Santa Monica, but our public land we already own. So that's protected against that inflation. So that's an important part of what we do and we need it to address the needs of people who are living in dilapidated housing, hopefully not a lot of that in Santa Monica. Um, we have definitely people who are in overcrowded conditions um, who would need new housing um, and also to make a place for, for both our you know, low wage workers um, to have a place in our city and also for the right of return so that there's actually some place for folks to come back to. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that we um, have started and now have, we're in the second phase of our pilot program is a local rent subsidy program, um, what we call the Preserve Our Diversity Program. Um, and for, for reasons originally that were based on political reality, the initial group that that went to was to seniors. Um, and you can see here that um, we're now able for less than $1.6 million a year to, um, to take care of 257 uh, senior households to take people who were severely rent burdened and change it so that they now have enough after rent income to meet the minimum basic needs budget that's developed by the UCLA um, uh, public health uh, uh, department. Um, they have what they call an elder index. And so that's a very cost effective, about 80% of those are single people and 20% are um, couples. Um, and that's, so we're probably helping about 300 people a, a year um, for 1.6 million. And some of us like myself, <laughs> pressing council, we'd like to see that program expanded and expanded beyond just seniors so that we can help address some of more of those folks who are extremely rent burdened and already living here. So, and so what do we need to do that? It's money um, and obviously measures GS and GSH were a start. Um, and this, I don't think I need to tell this group, but I sometimes like to read this because you know the difference um, uh, uh, in people's lives between where, you know, one of the people who wrote a letter in the very initial pilot saying, you know, it's, I can now buy luxuries like paper towel. Um, I, I just think it's really important for, for people to understand what it really means for someone to be low income or extremely low income and paying more than 50% of their income in rent, what that really means to their lives and how much we can, we can make their lives better uh, by doing that. Um, 
this is just, you know, we, we're 100,000 people here in Santa Monica. Um, you know, we can do only so much. We need support from the state and the county and the federal government. <laughs> um, as, uh, uh, as I point out here as well. Um, but, you know, we're working very hard now with this commitment from the city to use our public land. Um, we're working on a bill, SMUR and, and Move LA has sponsored a bill with Senator Ben Allen in, in Sacramento, which passed its first committee to try and set up a structure whereby, you know, the city and the county and the state will all match each other for affordable housing as a way of generating money. Um, there may be new tax uh, initiatives, you know, ballot measures and the like to do that. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Section 8 because I know that's that's important for folks here and the issue, you know, President Biden campaigned that he was going to fully fund the Section 8 program right now, you know, it, in, in Los Angeles County, it's about 30% of income qualified households receive vouchers. Apparently nationwide, it's less than that. It's only like 25%. So in other words, we have another 70 to 75% of people who should be receiving Section 8 vouchers, but there isn't enough money to go around. So they're not getting them. And you know, I hope he's gonna be able to keep this campaign promise, but um, we're, not there. we're not there yet at least in the infrastructure bill they're talking about, they are talking about deeming affordable housing as, as infrastructure and spending money there. And that could be another source of money for us to, to build affordable housing on our public land here. But as to section eight, here, here's the challenge in Santa Monica. Um, when I first got involved, <coughs> excuse me, on the housing commission, um, in addition to the question of, you know, discrimination against households and the like, which the city um, <clears throat> took the lead on in banning, and actually now the state has banned it as well. So the law is very strong that you shouldn't be allowed to discriminate against people based on Section 8. But apart from all of that, um, <clears throat> rents are so high here in Santa Monica that for new, you know, for when you get a new apartment, that when I first got involved, um, the maximum amount that the federal government will allow us uh, to pay under Section 8, put us in what's called the fifth percentile. That meant 95% of the rents for new housing in Santa Monica was higher than the maximum amount that um, the federal government will let us pay under the Section 8 program. And uh, at that time, Tony Vasquez was the uh, mayor of Los Angeles, Los Angeles, of Santa Monica, and um, Sue and he both were in Washington and Ted Lou arranged for them to meet with HUD uh, to make the case. And our staff wrote a, a fantastic letter with all this detail making the case um, that they should grant what's called an exception payment standard. In other words, let us pay a lot more. And in fact, we have now that was successful and we now have a higher maximum amount we're allowed to pay to landlords under the Section 8 program than almost anywhere in the United States. They didn't give us any more money, so that meant we could fund fewer, fewer vouchers, but they at least did that. But even that, at the time, only put us in the 40th percentile, which still meant that um, three out of every five apartments in Santa Monica, uh, the rent was higher than the maximum that the Section 8 program would allow uh, us to pay. Um, and so that helped some. Uh, but of course, rents have continued to go up. So we're no longer even in the 40th percentile. So that's a huge problem in terms of people finding it. Um, the city tried, we had a pilot program uh, called the house program, where we actually were gonna pay landlords a $5,000 bonus if they would um, take a section eight recipient into a, uh, a market you know, rate apartment. Um, and we also had some other things to, to help on some credit protection and things like that, it was not successful. Um, the city also allows in rent control units, um, if, the, if the amount that's paid under Section 8 is higher than the rent control amount, that we can pay the, rent, the Section 8 amount and it won't violate the rent control law. But even with all of that, um, it's just not been very successful. So the Section 8 program, I think, has sort of two 
functions for us. One is right now, um, it's best and most effective use is some of those 7,250 extremely rent burdened folks who are at least already in housing because the way they're surviving there is that the, they're in longer term rent control units. So the rent is lower than the current market rate um, and the section eight program you know, can probably cover what's needed there even under this payment standard. In addition, the landlord can't pretend that they have any other reason for rejecting um, the voucher uh, than discrimination on Section 8 basis if the tenant's already living there, so they pretty much have to take those. The other is I'm hopeful that President Biden really will come through and fully fund this, and if they do, then I think um, our local rent subsidy program role will switch. It won't be filling the gap of all of these people who should be getting Section 8 vouchers but aren't, and so we're having to step into the breach, but then maybe we can use our our local rent subsidy program to, you know, cover on top of what the maximum amount is that the Section 8 program will pay so that people can actually get into their, uh, get into private apartments. Um, but right now, uh, that has not yet happened. So I think with that, um, I'll just close by saying, you know, there's a huge amount to do here. Um, uh, there's more than, than the resources that exist right now, the need far outstrips that. So we have to use the resources we have as intelligent we can, and we have to increase the resources in the city. And you know, if this public land is committed, that's you know hundreds of millions of dollars that's being committed there. Um, but we have to get help from the county, we have to get help from the state, and we have to get help from the federal government. And I'm hopeful that things are changing some, and also the fact that we're we're putting up. Um, we'll put pressure on them to put up as well. So with that, I'll pass it on to our next uh, speaker and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mike, that was really insightful. I know we're gonna have uh, probably a lot of questions for you too. I'm gonna hand off to Robbie who is going to introduce us to our next speaker. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is great. Okay, I have the honor of introducing today uh, Ms. Elena Pop. Elena Pop is a social change activist. She has been involved in the women's rights, LGBT rights, Chicano rights, economic rights, and peace and justice movements since 1976, when a UFW worker spoke in her high school history class and, uh, about Proposition 14. She is an attorney and the executive director of uh, the Eviction Defense Network, a 501c3 nonprofit organization at the forefront of the fight against gentrification in Los Angeles County. The Eviction Defense Network, or EDN, is part of the LA Council Right to Council Coalition and it's stayhousedla.org program. EDN is also part of the Healthy LA Coalition, fighting for strong policy solutions in the city and county of Los Angeles during the pandemic. EDN is also proud to be a member of the Housing Now Coalition, fighting for laws that protect tenants at the state level. Elena has nearly 40 years experience in legal services focused primarily in the area of housing and community economic development. Elena wants to be a teacher when she grows up and follow in the footsteps of Claire Goldblum, who asked her to represent Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in a mock trial and turned a pepster into a serious social change activist, a woman after my own heart. Um, let me introduce to you, and maybe those of you who are on know her already, but Miss Elena Pop. Hi, everyone. I want to start by apologizing for not turning on my screen. Um, I have been sick and I am laying down and it's not a pretty sight. So we're going to do this um, uh, without um, with just the PowerPoint. 
Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the honor of speaking uh, with Sue and Mike, who I respect tremendously. Mike and I were on a Port Connect hearing the other day uh, and it was great to see him there too. So um, my job is to talk about what happened to the tsunami. And this is a screenshot from a presentation that I developed in the early days of the pandemic on how to stop an eviction tsunami in four easy steps. And the four easy steps were organizing, policy advocacy, community education, and legal support. Um, and we did a lot of that. So before the pandemic, we had rent stabilization in certain cities. Because of the pandemic or during the pandemic, we have fought for what, you know, when I'm in public settings, I talk about a very weak patchwork of protections um, that are inadequate, and they are inadequate in so many ways. They, they were inadequate for people who got locked out on Friday and on Thursday and people who will get locked out tomorrow. Uh, actually, no one gets locked out tomorrow, but on Tuesday, people will get locked out. So the protections that we've gotten, which are protections at the state level, uh, 40 of our 88 local cities have protections. The county law, if it's stronger, protects. And then the Center for Disease Control order. That patchwork of protections has uh, actually um, lowered um, the number of eviction filings. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So that advocacy um, resulted in saving, not starting, but on April uh, 6th or 7th, uh, Chief Justice uh, Kantil Sakuye um, uh, gave us what we called rule one. Rule one is the closest thing we got to a moratorium on evictions. It allowed eviction filings, but the court would not issue a summons. Without a summons, the court has no power over the defendant, and hence the defend that there is no way to proceed unless the tenant, in a you know not knowing their rights, goes in and files uh, a an answer, in which case the court then acquires jurisdiction or power over the defendant. The result of this rule was a decrease of over 90% in eviction filings in LA County. I will show you those statistics in a minute. It was effective. It was effective. But then the governor decided, well, the district council got sued twice. And so there was a... Uh, Can we get the person where the noise is coming from to mute? Um, so the Judicial Council issued warnings to the governor, one in June, one in July. Uh, you need to do something. We can't keep this rule going. And advocates were fighting for a stronger law. The governor at the last minute came in and gave us AB 3088. You know, my, my analogy has been that um, that we are a wounded patient lying on the ground. Our communities are bleeding out, uh, nearly a half a million people at risk of eviction, and that the governor and to a great extent local government looked at a dying patient and said, uh, let's put some band-aids on this. Um, and then the um, a judicial council came and put a tourniquet on it. And it was a good tourniquet. It didn't deal with the infection, meaning the debt. That was still there, but it stopped the bleed. Reduction of 90% from pre-COVID numbers uh, for the months that rule one was in effect. So the governor then comes in, rule one gets lifted on um, September 4th and a AB 3088 imposes a uh, prohibition on eviction filings for non-payment of rent until October 5th. So that was a looser tourniquet um, because other evictions then started being filed in large numbers. Um, people often ask, when do you have do when, when do I have to start paying rent again? Well, under the successor to AB 38, SB 91, you have to start paying rent when that law lifts at the end of June. 
We are working to replace it with something else. Um, but our answer to tenants who ask that question is you have to start paying rent when you get a job, when you can pay rent, when you can take care of health needs and other needs um, and pay your rent safely. But you do have to pay 25% of your rent from September through June by the end of June so that you can stay out of eviction court, which is a provision under SB 91. Um, th these are the statistics on eviction filings. LA County, 71,000 evictions were filed in 2009. You will note a progressive decrease. In 2002, the number was 73,000. So there's been a progressive decrease all the way to 2019. And that decrease, when you compare it to the increase in representation, which is primarily through the sliding fee program that Eden developed, we went from representing 1,300 tenants a year collectively in 2002 to 5,000 by 2019. Um, and when you increase representation, eviction filings go down because it's more costly for landlords to file evictions and because um, the bogus evictions disappear when tenants have lawyers. Um, so that had been going down, but look what happened in 2020. Uh, we went down to a little bit under 14,000. And if you look at the monthly comparisons, uh, the average in 2019 was 3,181 a month. And look at how these averages went down by April, we were down to 526, and that includes four days, uh, seven days before Rule 1 went into effect. Then it goes down, 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 down. And then we have the lifting of Rule 1 in September, but there's still a ban on non payment of evictions until October 5th. And then October, they shoot up, shoot up. And I'm sorry for the exclamation mark, but that's a little under 1,000. Um, and so the, the average number of filings. In 2019, 3,381. During um, April through September, 370. June, July, and August, 355. Uh, these are the three months where Rule 1 was completely in effect the entire month. And then now that Rule 1 is lifted, we're seeing this increase. When people ask us, when do I have to pay my back rent? The answer to that is, it depends on who you ask. Uh, the governor says you have to pay your back rent effective, um, start, you have to have it, have it paid by July, August 1st. Local electeds say it's whatever date we told you, right? So County of LA is for, uh, 12 months after the state of emergency ends. City of LA the same. I'm not exactly sure what Santa Monica's is, but each, each of the local jurisdictions that has a law said you have to pay the rent X number of days after we say the state of emergency ends. There is this preemption language in SB 91. Um, if you ask 10 stay housed LA attorneys, when tenants have to pay the rent, you get 10 different answers. Um, I'm actually taking the more conservative view. I think it, there is a serious preemption issue and we need to get rid of it in, in legislation so that people have some time to come up and breathe uh, before they are sent to small claims court. Um, the diagram on your screen, I created for myself so I would not forget to check every single possible defense. These are all the laws that protect tenants right now and who they protect against what and what the requirements are. And we have a full on two hour presentation that explains all of this that I will invite you to and the links are in the, in the slides. The point of the slide is to say they, cre they create a safety net, a safety net that doesn't quite look like this one, it looks more like this one. People are falling through the cracks because we're in the middle of a health crisis, an economic crisis, nearly a half a million households are unable to pay the rent. Landlord harassment is on the rise. I compared September figures um, to pre-COVID uh, figures and the number of people that report to us that they are being harassed has increased by 1,532%. Uh, if you take away harassment that only is phone and text and about the rent, 
then it's 352%, which an increase, which is still outrageous. Illegal lockouts are on the rise, 75% higher than pre-COVID. And we don't know, all live in jurisdictions where all you have to do is call your city attorney and you get support in getting people back in. In LA, in most of the county, in order to get a, restore a tenant to possession, we have initiated something called rapid response, where we literally send people out five to 10 or 20, and they put the tenant back in. And then the landlord calls the police because if the police arrive and the tenant is out, the police tell the tenant, this is a civil matter, sue your landlord, and there aren't lawyers to file these lawsuits. So we need to get the tenant back in. If the tenant is in, they tell the landlord, uh, this is a civil matter, kick the tenant out through the eviction process. Instead of just enforcing the law, it is illegal to lock out a tenant. Um, that's different in Santa Monica, by the way. Pro you know, I cut my teeth in Santa Monica. Uh, I uh, lived in Venice, worked in Santa Monica, and I often tell people the stories of tenant gets locked out, you call the city attorney, the city attorney sends a cop car to pick you up and take you to your cl client's house, and the city attorney is in the car too, and then they tell the landlord, let this person back in, or we're going to prosecute you for breaking the law, and that's how it should be. Um, the, law, the laws, the COVID laws are very confusing. They have a lot of steps that people have to take, which also creates this, uh, this problem with people falling through the safety net. Um, and they have these, you know, they're for two months and then another two months, which creates a lot of anxiety for people uh, since we don't know if they're going to get renewed. Um, and then uh, lastly, there is not enough legal assistance. So my analogy in the presentations is we are a ship in a storm. We are taking in water. A lot of the passengers have fallen in the water and most of the lawyers are doing search and rescue. So now that you are connected to our little system, please remember you have to come to the webinars and ask your questions here because we don't have time to ask your questions in between the webinars. You will all have my cell phone number and the digital device and the um, and the hotline number so that you can call it in an emergency, but use it only for an emergency because if you call it during the day, it's the equivalent of we're get, you know, bringing a, a, a passenger that's fallen overboard onto the ship, we're trying to get them up and you're throwing a bucket of water in our mouths instead of, um, instead of helping us to, to do the search and rescue. We're expecting people, we have, we, I just added a webinar. We have four now a, a week, Tuesday, Thursday, two on Saturday, where we explain the laws, explain their rights, explain everything, and then do one-on-ones with people. Uh, it's a way to build community and it's a, build to get, a way to get people connected with each other and connected to organizing, but it's also a way for us to be able to monitor cases um, with, um, without spending a lot of time on the phone with people. Um, I wanna make sure people stop using the word moratorium. There is no moratorium. There has never been a moratorium and it confuses the general population. I have people who have sat on their rights until the sheriff was dragging them out because they thought they were protected by a moratorium. Nothing stops the service of notices or the filing of evictions. And if you don't use these laws, to protect yourself in court, the sheriff will come and kick you out. And we have not been able to stop the, them from doing that. This is the sample, a sample of our version of the declaration you have to use to get into a, to stay out of eviction court. You can get this on the State House LA's LA website. Um, and everybody who has not paid rent and has not done this. Even if your landlord has not sent you a 15 day notice or a declaration, should fill it out for all the months you haven't paid and then send it to the landlord and come to our webinars to figure out how to do it. Um, that will keep you out of eviction court. And this is our step by step for staying out of eviction court, which I won't go over in detail because I want to encourage folks to come to our seminars and because I'm running out of time. If you need legal help, anybody in the county should plug in through the Stay Housed LA website. Uh, you go on, you can learn about your rights, you can sign up for a, for a webinar, or, and there's, we've got like two or three a day. So there's, we meaning the broad coalition has two or three a day, and Eden does four a week. So four of those are eviction defense so network. Um, 
or you can sign up for, get, for getting legal help. You fill out a questionnaire and immediately after you submit, you get the name of the community-based organization and the legal uh, services program that will help you. Um, and there's also a digital divide hotline. Some folks, this whole thing is funded by the LA County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Um, and some people do complain that we're not getting back to folks fast enough. I will admit that Eden is, if you are not in eviction court or not being illegally locked out, we are sending you an invitation to the webinar. And if you can't get to the webinar, I don't know, but we have a digital divide hotline and we need people to take responsibility for get educated because we're, me, myself, my own inbox is 250 emails average a day. And that ain't, doesn't include all of my other staff. The need is greater than the resources. Um, this slide shows what Eden is doing. So we're representing tenants in the Moss Court, Pasadena Court, and West Covina Courts. To get services from us, you go to edn.la, fill out an eviction prevention form, wait for a response. You have to already be in court for us to open the case. The immediate lockout line is available for anyone in the entire county. It's answered 24 hours a day. It's for immediate lockout emergencies. It activates a rapid response team to go and put the tenant back in possession and deal with the police. Uh, people in other courts, including the Santa Monica court, should access services through the Stay Housed LA website. That's my timer. Uh, and when you and, and when you do, if the legal services provider does not get back to you within 48 hours, there's a number where you can call to make that happen. Also, uh, countywide digital divide issues. Honestly, folks, if you have someone who has a digital divide issue, cure the digital divide issue. The government has uh, smartphones available, uh, subsidized smartphones. You, any of the of the of the uh, uh, service providers that provide a uh, cell phone service can uh, for low income people. The government will subsidize the phone, and we need to teach people how to use the internet and how to use email and how to do all of that because it's the right. You know, it's the equivalent of saying I can't use a telephone. People will get left behind. But if you know, we do have a digital divide line, and it is right there. These are the webinars. I urge you to attend them. They are actually very good. Let's remember that 90% of landlords have representation. In LA County, only 12% of tenants, which is better than anywhere else in the country. Uh, but less than 1% of tenants that go to court alone win. Um, we need to do something to help people who are not in court because the legal services programs are not going to be able to, to handle it. The Access LA program is the idea of training lay people in existing organizations to do uh, handholding, advocacy, negotiating with the landlord, and to do it with under the supervision of lawyers. If you wanna know more about that, you can ask during the Q&A. We are implementing that program in what we call the NELAC Coalition, North e Northeast LA County, the, the communities that feed into the West Covina and Pasadena courts. And with that, I will close and thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. Um, this is, I, I'm just excited. This is really good. Um, Robbie and I are going to be tag teaming on our Q&A list of folks that have uh, signed up through us already. Um, and I guess we will start with Charles Adeyaba. He had a question. Um, Charles, would you like to ask a question or I can ask for you? Uh, you can ask the question because it's in the, it's in the chat somewhere. Okay, and I gotcha. I don't what else. I'm so yeah. sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you. Okay, so this question is for uh, Mayor Hilmerich. Um, Charles would like to know, what is your role in the Santa Monica Airport land? Is that public, is that land public owned or is that something that we can consider as, you know, parcel to use for affordable housing? So um, thank you for the question. And uh, a lot of people have been asking that and please tell me you aren't how the West was one who keeps, tweeting about this. So somebody, somebody keeps tweeting about this. The airport is off limits, at least until 2028. 
We have a consent decree with the federal government. And in addition, we have our own uh, uh, measure that brought about that consent decree, a measure called LC that said that we can't make any use of the land uh, for other than a park unless it goes to the voters of Santa Monica. Uh, Sue Millman asked the question, how will the city protect homes sold to individuals at, as affordable or low income so owners don't sell and profit take? So I, I answered Susan in the chat. I, I've known Susan forever. And, and I just want to give a shout out to Elena, who I adore. I've been on so many of these programs with her. She's fantastic. I mean, she was in the Santa Monica courthouse for years. Um, and, and I adore her. Uh, actually, in, Los in Santa Monica, I think it's LAFLA that's servicing the program. Elaine, is that right? Anyway, I, I believe that LAFLA is- Sorry, the it's LAFLA and Betsetic Legal Services. Right, so you'll be directed to them should you call um, the LA County um, number. But in any case, um, the way that uh, these deed restricted for purchase units work is that they have a limited um, resale price and it's limited by formula and as Robbie and I were discussing this morning, the problem is that most people want to have for purchase so that they get the benefit of the upside of the market. And when you buy, whether it's a limited equity co-op or you're in a, a, um, a land trust, there are various different ways of, of basically getting to the same point. You do not get the kind of profits that you get on the private market you basically um, cash out at where you came in. What it's meant to do is provide more housing for more people and not to give any uh, particular person a windfall as a result of getting this housing. Uh, I personally um, have misgivings about for purchase housing because I think that when you have, it, it would create so few units unless we come up with a different model than the ones I know that it would become in essence a lottery for a very few people. And how do you decide who wins that lottery? When you're, uh, so as I also said to Robbie this morning, I'm concerned about pushing the most affordable housing in the shortest time out, out to the people in Santa Monica who need it today. So this is more complicated. For purchase is more complicated. We know how to do the rental. We know how to do 100% affordable housing. So uh, our focus right now is on that, I believe. Craig Ali, when the city looks at affordable housing creation, is it restricted to certain areas or does it take an overall view of the city's boundaries? Anybody? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to address that. But let me also first give a shout out to Elena. She is the most dedicated tenants rights warrior that I have met in my time in Los Angeles, and she's remarkable. Um, I'll also say that on Tuesday, I'm going to be having a meeting with representatives from Legal Aid, BetSedek, um, Mental Health Advocacy Services, and the City Attorney's Office in, in um, in uh, Santa Monica to arrange another SMER webinar on this topic of in this city, what to do. So I will make sure to send, once we have that set up the link to, to um, Robbie and to Angela and you guys can distribute that. So hopefully people can get some very localized information. Um, in terms of affordable housing in the city, um, R1 neighborhoods, because they're zoned for for single family homes don't accommodate um, affordable housing, but every other uh, area has had affordable housing and there is um, affordable housing throughout the city. There's actually one of the criteria um, in the, uh, that the city uses is to try and disperse uh, affordable housing. And there's actually um, considerably more than I think people understand um, located in other 
neighborhoods. I think there's a perception that all of the affordable housing in the city of Santa Monica is located in the Pico neighborhood, and that's just not true. Um, in fact, I sent to the uh, planning staff something I had someone put together for me, um, which I have not proved, so I can't guarantee the 100% accuracy, but um, sort of dividing the, the city north, south, north of Wilshire, north of Colorado, north of Pico, and below that, and then also east-west with Lincoln. Um, and there is significant affordable housing throughout the city. Um, I will say for myself, um, well, let me say two things. One is um, in the listening and learning mode from being at this organization at times and the Santa Monica Democratic Club Diversity Inclusion Committee, um, I understand the importance of acknowledging the history um, of what has happened in this city and everywhere else in America in terms of redlining and the like. Um, and so I understand the value of that. Let me also say that when I, and you heard in my introduction, I'm focused on cost effectiveness, that when I first got on the Housing Commission, and it was at a time when, because the state had taken away the money we had been using, uh, the redevelopment money, we had very little money in the Housing Trust Fund, um, there was a project to put affordable housing in the Sunset Park neighborhood. And the city, to carry out this, this goal, but they spent it was something like $6.6 .6 million and it was gonna help 10 people. It was 10 single person units. And for that same six plus million, if we gave that to community core, um, they could probably build, um, roughly estimating here about 24 family units, which could mean we could help 75 to 100 people. In an ideal world, um, you know, I would like to accomplish all of these things, but when I see 7,250 Santa Monica households that are severely rent burdened and low income and the like, um, I do think it's important to, to get as much help to people immediately as possible. So I, I think we do both, um, but um, I, I think that the motivation of more recent locations has been one of trying to help as many people as possible with limited funds. Um, so hopefully that's, that's an answer to the question. So, so I wanna sort of add a little to Michael's story because I was there and Patricia was there too. And uh, Tara may have been there, I can't remember um, at the time, maybe not. But um, when the neighborhood was fighting this affordable housing um, project in Sunset Park, there was a lot of neighborhood resistance that came in front of the Housing Commission a few times. After the project was completed, the neighbors got to know their neighbors and suddenly embraced the project and started coming to us, meaning the city council, perhaps the Housing Commission, with many, many reasons why the housing that we provided was inadequate and the many things we needed to do to improve that housing. So uh, for people who worry about having affordable housing in their neighborhood or near them, they need to be reassured that, first of all, it's probably already there and they don't even know it, right? I, I'm just saying, you don't know if it's affordable or not affordable. We have five or six buildings, some community core, but a bunch of other people right by the ocean that you would never dream or any different than any other building there. So this idea that uh, for some reason, affordable housing is undesirable, that section eight tenants are undesirable, et cetera. I think many people learn to the contrary when they've actually experienced living near it. Um, I also want to address the idea of R1 neighborhoods because we in fact proposed in the housing element um, we, the city council, are, uh, plan to create an overlay for R1 neighborhoods other than those that were um, uh, basically disrupted by, um, by redlining um, and, and by the freeway, et cetera. But um, so sparing those, but what that means is, so this is 100% affordable housing overlay, but what that would mean is, this is the example I've been giving today, so I'll give it again. If I uh, deeded, if I uh, left my house when I died 
the Community Corporation of Santa Monica, they could take my lot and build 100% affordable housing on it, which I assume would be whatever was allowed, you know, four to eight units or whatever the, the zoning allowed in an R1 neighborhood. So, so if this overlay goes through, and by the way, this is happening all over the state and the country, I suspect there will be some kind of challenge to it somewhere, a legal challenge, uh, I doubt will be the first. But uh, I think this is gonna work. So, um, so in perhaps six months or eight months, you will be able to build affordable housing anywhere, including R1 neighborhoods. Thank you, Mayor. Um, next, we have uh, Jay Johnson. And I think, Jay, you want to go ahead and ask your question, or would you like me to ask it for you? Yes, I'll ask the question uh, to uh, both uh, Michael and Sue. The American Rescue Plan Act will give our city $29 million. Section 3206 covers homeowner assistance funds. Will some of the money be allocated to property owners and landlords to repair and protect existing aging rent controlled properties? And why have not landlords nor business owners been consulted on allocation of the millions involved? Do you propose that they be consulted? Thank you. So I'll take that. And uh, there is a staff report right now. The city council is not, has not decided what to do with those funds. Um, in fact, staff has a proposal that um, I encourage everybody to look at on our upcoming agenda. Um, I did not see any funds being allocated towards um, uh, towards tenant towards landlord improvements of aging infrastructure. But I can tell you that um, we have been we and staff the city council, I've been going to every chamber um, board meeting as staff goes to them. And I've been meeting with the chamber, the Pierre Lessies Association and every other group in the city since I've been the mayor. And Jay, I must have missed your phone call when you were asking to talk to me. Cause I've been talking to everybody. And I think a lot of this meeting will, a lot of people in this meeting will attest to it. So call me anytime, happy to talk. So um, Sue, um, Okay, so there's an apartment building off of uh, 12th in Wilshire. It's owned by Century West Property. And from what I understand, they are refusing now to accept any Section 8 uh, vouchers or anything like that. And the people that still remain there now that have Section 8 vouchers, they have given them eviction notices to be out, I think, within a year's time. There's one woman that's 80, there's one that's 86, and there's one that's 88. Plus there's a couple families. So I wanna address this, but I wanna address like two of the ladies. Two of the ladies, the 86 and the 88 year old, they speak Russian only. And I wanted to know how can I find a way to advocate for these particular women? They've been living there for 24 years. No, I, I hear you, Gina. Are they evicting, are they getting rid of tenants in the building to elicit? Sue, Sue, can I? Oh, Michael I think, knows something. I don't know anything. Uh, th this may be a building that I've heard about. Is this the one that was set up as affordable units, but also um, take section eight? Because I know that the Legal Aid Foundation is uh, already um, representing people if it's the same building. I'm thinking about, since I've heard about this uh, directly from them, I'm being careful here because some of this is in a privileged conversation. Okay, so so I can't. can I give you the address? Yeah, um, I and uh, I think it may be one that um, that's already, and if these folks aren't already in contact with the legal aid folks, then they should get in contact with them and, and, and they will. Yeah, but they don't a, speak English. They're up in age. So how do I advocate for them? I, the most effective thing, I think you heard from Elena, um, people who don't have lawyers lose. So the most effective thing you can do for them is get them connected with um, a lawyer. So if you put the um, 
the address in the chat to me, I will double check um, and see if it's the one that's already there. And then um, what, what I can do is if you also give me your contact information, I can pass that on to the folks at Legal Aid who are working on that building if it's the one I think of. And they can, they can talk to you about how to best advocate. And Legal Aid has the capacity to talk to them in Russian. We use something called language line. Okay. And, uh, and Gina, um, I, I, it sounds to me as if they're doing something with the entire building, but if nobody's talked to the city attorney's office, you should talk to them. Yeah, I was going to send a letter just to represent them. I mean, I don't mind representing the whole building, you know, and talk about all the six units that are being evicted, but I know if it's the uh, same building we're talking about. There's already communication with the city attorney's office. So let's let's first okay, see if so, it's the same one that's so already I just, moving here. I just said it to you, so. Give me a smile, give me a smile. Y'all know how this goes. Wait, I have a question. Gina, <laughs> yeah. how do you talk to them? If they speak Russian, how do you talk to them? Well, usually I'm bringing them food and groceries and stuff like that. So they're like, my daughter. <laughs> Uh, so I just confirmed that is in fact the same building um, and there are definitely legal aid lawyers on the case in this and whatever. So I'm going to, um, if, if you give me your email address or the like, I can put you in contact with them. Yeah. And if you get back in touch with me too, I want to say something to you as well. Sure. From Craig Hamilton. Craig, you want to do your question or would you like me to just read it? I can just read it, Robbie. Okay, it's for Sue or Michael. Uh, if in Santa Monica, we're going to produce nine to 10,000 units of housing in the next 10 years, what do, they, what do you think is the best uh, mix of affordable, low income, uh, ownership, market rate, et cetera, that would do the most good in your opinion? for Sue and Michael. So let me start, Michael. I, I have, I don't think we need to produce 10,000 units. And that was part of the idea of, of giving, of using city land. I think that um, this mandate of 6,000, um, 6,100, I should say affordable units and, and a couple of thousand um, market rate units was really meant to create more market rate housing. I, I, I don't believe that this is a completely um, straightforward process, but we've been mandated about uh, concerning how much we must produce um, during the next eight years, including how many units in each category. Now we know that we're gonna produce the market rate units. We've never had a problem. We have had a problem with producing moderate units, i.e. units that uh, support people who um, make between 80 and 120% of AMI, right? That would be a, a category that's hard for us because we get no federal or state, there is no TCAC tax credits for that. And there are no federal subsidies for that kind of housing as the system currently works. Uh, Michael and I have talked to at least one provider who specializes in this area and could produce a, a certain specialized kind of unit. So the kind of unit that when people say to me, why can't my children live here, right? This is where your children could live if we were to build it. So, um, or if somebody was to build it. So I, I think that our current target should be to meet the RENA goals and that um, uh, with respect to the market rate, uh, this gets us into another topic, but so many people who live in this city or don't live in this city have um, a place here and a place somewhere else. They have two houses, three houses, four houses, right? I mean, which to me is um, so repugnant. We have 60,000 people or more living on the streets of LA and people who have four houses, five houses. I got a letter from someone who owns three houses uh, or four houses in my neighborhood. 
So look, I mean, we all know this is a committee for racial justice, but forget it, this is just a justice issue. There is something wrong here. And we all know there's something wrong. The question is what we're gonna do about it. So uh, I don't care what we produce in the next eight years other than this affordable housing, but I think we're gonna produce it uh, because I think we have a plan now to produce it and we have the will to produce it because I'll talk to every funder in the universe until we get the money to match our land and build this housing. And that's how you get things done. Um, I'll just briefly add to that. So just so people know, this is what the Southern California Association of Governments um, allocated to us um, in the city. So 31.4% uh, of, the, of the new housing should be for very low income. That's for people earning less than 50% of that 77,000 for a, uh, a family of four. So that would be people, you know, earning 38,000 or less for a family of four. And that's 2,794 units. Then they assign for the, the next group, which is 50 to 80% of that 77,000 uh, units of so topping out at, in the low 60s for a family of four, another 18.8%. So that's 1,672 units. Then for 80 to 120%, so that's low 60s to um, up to say, you know, $90,000 for a family of four, that's another 19%, that's 1,702 units. And then for the market rate units, 2,727 or 30%. So that's what the targets they've given us. Um, in other words, of, of, the, of the close to 9,000 units that they've assigned to us, about 70% would have to be deed restricted affordable housing, not market rate. Um, as Sue says, the 27,227 market rate units, we already have in the pipeline about 1,600 units of market rate housing. So we're going to get to cover that. The big challenge is creating the, the affordable housing. Um, to me, the, you know, it's um, that, you know, the people who are suffering the most are the ones who should get it first. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's what I'd like to see, but I'd certainly like to create all of this housing. And, um, uh, you know, we may have the will, uh, and we need to get the county, the state and the federal government to assist us and they should want to, because this is precisely, you know, everybody is talking this game about, um, uh, you know, trying to move people out of concentrated areas of poverty into high resource communities were exactly that kind of community. Um, and, you know, if they're not willing to help us do it here, then they're not serious about, about affordable housing. And so I think we can put them to the test. Great. Okay, Adrina, do you want to uh, grace us with your question? Thank you, Robbie and Angela for having this form available to us. I wish I had more time. I would have emailed so many more people. This is an awesome opportunity um, to even experience the conversations that's already taken place. My, converse, my question is for you, Sue and Michael. With the buildings that are about to take place and the development of the properties itself, are you guys looking at black developers, architects, engineers, different contracts that can help build from the ground up. This has been a very um, crucial year for many people. And I know one of the churches, Bishop Charles E. Blake, West Angeles, he made it a point through various ties that he wanted to only deal with black entrepreneurs and builders when he built the mega church, which is located on Crenshaw Boulevard, right next to the Exposition Expo. So um, we are um, in the city. So, so let me just say one of the odd things about the city of Santa Monica is that while the city council sets policy I definitely, and, and Michael has had this experience too, as the chair of the housing commission, we are kept at arm's length from operational decisions, including who the contract, I mean, the city council ultimately approves it, but most of this is really done by our professional staff. 
So what you're talking about, and, and we talked about in connection with the Miramar and, and the project there, and Tara is here too, I think that we uh, could, although I, I wonder, again, I, I, I'm in a little bit unsure ground here. Because we're a government, I think that um, we are under uh, rules that were not, as we all know, repealed by Prop 16 in the last election. And these rules uh, govern how we favor, don't favor um, certain contractors, et cetera. I am not firm or, or strong on the law around that because it's not something I agree that it should be done and we thought it should be done on the Miramar project um, at the time, but there are legal constraints on what we as a city can do. Just have to say that private operators can do different things than we can do. And I'm not sure what the constraints are, but I wholly support your sentiments. And certainly we are trying to do that sort of thing through our um, recovery, business recovery program. Okay, thank you. If I could, I could add to that. Um, so first of all, I completely agree with your sentiment. Um, one of the things that was most shocking to me personally after George Floyd's murder and refocusing everybody's attention at my law firm, people sent around readings so that we could all come up to speed. And the thing that was shocking, most shocking to me, I mean, uh, I was aware that, you know, there was disproportionate policing to people of color and whatever, but the thing that truly shocked me and that I feel terrible that I didn't realize is that basically my entire life, um, there was zero progress in closing the um, wealth gap between black people and white people in this country. And I just, I didn't know that until then. And I feel ashamed that I didn't know that, but I didn't, and that was shocking to me. And that, you know, college educated black people had less wealth than high school educated white people in America. Um, and so the whole, idea that education is the opportunity, you know, the ladder to opportunity, whatever. So it really shocked me. And I, and I remember thinking <laughs> that as hard as it is going to be to address the other issues, it's going to be even harder to address this issue because there really is no reason for anyone to feel like they're losing anything from, you know, fair policing and not being racist and whatever. But when you start talking about how we're gonna address wealth gaps, it's gonna require steering resources in certain ways. Uh, I only say this as a prelude to, um, I had you know discussions with Kristen McCowan about this because I felt very strongly that I'd like to see us do that. We were hoping that Prop 209 would be repealed so that um, the government would have more latitude, although there are federal restrictions. She told me that um, you know, the city of LA has some form of program where while you can't, you know, give preference in the way that was being asked in this question, where you could at least assure that, um, you know, black owned um, vendors would be in a position to compete. Um, and anyway, so I've, I've had some discussions. So I think there's more the city needs to do in that area. Um, but it's going to be constrained by, unfortunately, these legal um, limits that are there. But it's a very important thing um, uh, that you raise. So I wish I had a better answer for you. But that's, that's what I understand from, from looking at and talking with Kristen. Well, the, the good thing is, and I just want to say thank you again. The good thing is um, law is in place because of us, we the people. We place the laws, we registrate for the laws, we are very proactive on the laws. So it's us people, us residents, all the way around from city to city to state to state, we're the ones that implement laws. So we are also the ones to change the laws. And that's why we tip our hats to everybody in the legal profession. It's not an easy profession, but we thank you for all the things that you guys do for your professionalism and your fortitude and all the hours you guys spend in representing us who are not wearing those hats. So once again, I just wanna say thank you again for this forum. Thank you.
Okay. Um, Elena has me putting some things in the in the uh, chat regarding um, COVID uh, tenant protections. I put that, Elena. You didn't ask me to put that, but I did. And then also, um, I'm going to put the slides uh, from eviction defense network uh, workshops. I'll put that as well. Um, there were two other questions. One is um, oh, one is in regards to the eviction defense uh, network. Is that something that we could utilize in Santa Monica? Um, I know I know personally in listening to Elena's um, presentation that you know there's we need more lawyers. We need more people to work this problem. Um, so is that something that we could? Um, you know, muster up some money to um, bring that e up some money. eviction defense to, um, huh? You recently, you recently did muster up some money. Oh, we did? And that money is going into the stay housed pool of money. So okay. there's basically this coalition. It's all 11 legal services programs that provide housing related services all over the county. And then we split up the courts. So instead of having tenants run all over the county um, and try to call us and not get help, right? All they have to do is go on the one website. Okay. And they all they fill out a questionnaire. They automatically get assigned to a community-based organization and a legal services program that will work together to address their concerns. Okay. Now the rub is. We're getting like so many requests that we can't stay on top of them all. And so what we are doing at Eden, and I'm taking this proposal to, to stay housed um, this week, we need to get, guide all of the people who are not in court into the webinars, because that's a good way. You, you explain it to 40 people at the same time, and then you do one-on-ones with 15 um that are still don't get it after the presentation and then save the resources for people who are already in court who are being illegally locked out or who have got a notice from the sheriff and if people in santa monica go on that website it is my understanding although i'm trying to confirm it legal aid foundation of los angeles bedsetic legal services and basta i think are the three stay housed um, agencies in santa monica Eden is the stay housed agency in Santa Monica for people who are not eligible for the program. Uh, so theoretically, a Santa Monica resident who earns more than 80% of median income would be referred back to Eden. And then we would represent them based on ability to pay. Um, but um, honestly, we couldn't handle that if it happened. So if it actually happened, we would have to figure out how to do a warm handoff probably to Basta and get Basta to do it. So anyone under 80% of income is covered. I think it's even a little higher than 80% of income for Santa Monica. I think your grant is higher than that. Uh, but if somebody were not eligible, then we would figure out. In my opinion, there is no reason why any tenant in LA County right now should not be getting full scope representation um, in court because we have the resources, we have the financial resources. We are having a little bit of a problem filling the positions. If you know a lawyer or a law graduate, whether licensed or not, we will get them provisionally licensed. We have, Eden has four positions open that we can't fill, so. Okay. Was that clear enough? send them to the website, send them to the website, the website will take care of them. And if for whatever reason, the website doesn't take care of them, they get their, their, their email, they're assigned to their agency, they, the agency doesn't call them, they can't get through through the agency. It's not because our receptionists are sitting there polishing their nails, it's because we're really getting too many calls. The, but people can come onto these webinars, and I put the ones that I do, and I counsel people anywhere in the county. And then what I will do, I have staff with me and we do gentle emails to our allies saying, your client that was assigned to you on next date came to the webinar, here's what we told them. Um, can you connect with them? And it's usually that little nudge that then gets the, 
gets that person to rise uh, to the attention. And again, it's it's because people are really swamped. Um, and so, but the, but these webinars, the Tuesday, Thursday, and two on Saturday, um, I would say they're really good if I do say so myself. And we and we really do connect with people, and then they connect with each other. Like you should see how beautiful it is. Like you know, the people keep coming back because part of what we do in those webinars, I call it Amazon Warrior Training. We're doing Amazon Warrior Training for men and women. Everybody comes out being strong and powerful. And if, and when they are still not looking strong, I mean, I will look, I'll point out the person who three months ago was a nervous ninny and look at that face. Do you see that face? That's a happy face. So you need to look like that face. And so, and then that person talks about their experience and we're trying to build strong, powerful, unnervous tenants because they make way better clients. Um, and, and they're really, the, the webinars are, are, the, the four that we do really, really do try to build community, make people feel powerful and and connect them to the right legal services program and the right CBO. So, OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. You're Elena. Um, OK. And so the other question that we have before we get to Fran's question. And is... I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, act, I actually wasn't sure. So it's not Betsetic, it's just Lafla and Basta. So oh, okay. Lafla and Basta are the two agencies in Santa Monica. Okay. Is, um, is there yeah. any way we can put that in the chat? Yeah. So but, can I uh, just add two things there? Because I'm sure oh. Elaine is generally up on on all of this. Uh, but one is um, be, because legal aid um, receives federal funding that thanks to our friends from the Reagan era, I think. Um, prohibit them from using that to represent um, undocumented people. Actually, I believe that SEDEC does in fact represent um, uh, undocumented people in Santa Monica. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to add is that, and unfortunately I don't know the answer to this, um, but the city has just literally last week started a pilot program on right to council um, and has a new contract with LAFLA about that program, which is on top of the one that had been going on before. And I'm not certain what those are. So again, as I mentioned, I'm hopefully gonna be learning about this for the SMER webinar and I'll pass that back to you so you can, can let people know. But for right now, you should definitely be following what um, Elena said about where the cutoffs are, except that Bet said it will help um, undocumented people in Santa Monica. Actually, I just got word from Barbara that that they're not that it's just legal aid and Basta. I I don't know. I, I thought it was Betsedic too, but um, I I I texted Barbara Schultz just to make sure, and it's Lafla and Basta for now, but Basta is representing people for free, and um, as part of the Statehouse program. Um, <laughs> Elena, does BASTA get LSC funding? No, they can represent undocumented. So that's why, Michael, BASTA too can represent people, uh, you know, who run into that problem. Because anyway, uh, follow what Elena is saying for right now. Um, that may be pursuant to this contract that the city just um, executed, but at least prior to that, that SEDEC was in fact helping people in Santa Monica. Okay, so the, the other question real quick is, um, um, before we get to Fran, we're coming to your question, Fran, but um, there have been uh, people in the uh, particularly African American community, and I'm like really shocked because I received one right after a conversation with the mayor, um, that there is uh, something happening in at Section 8 housing with particular um, uh, caseworkers that are harassing, uh, particularly the African American, the ones that I've received, African American community that have uh, trauma, emotional problems. Um, they are, you know, just really, um, you know, telling them, you know, you knew the let, uh, you know, they're getting fake eviction letters, and then they're being told to go ahead and move out 
because you knew it was coming. Um, and, you know, you should just go to St. Joseph's and so they can help you get housing. Um, have you guys heard any of that stuff coming? Because I've gotten like three or four calls, but the one, but today, just about three o'clock. Um, so I've got a couple of letters about that, uh, Robbie, but that would be the landlord doing that, not the Section 8 program. No, it was the landlord doing it, but someone in Section 8, a particular person's name that I have, that, well, that I was given, me, please. I will Is give it, it to somebody you. at our housing authority or, or uh, in, yes. in Santa Monica? Yes. It's not a federal give, person? I don't know, but it, I'll Just give it. Just send me the name. I'll, I will. I'll, I'll look into it. I will. It. Thank you. Okay. So last question I do believe is uh, from Fran. How much affordable housing is currently under construction and how much are in the planning stage, planning phase? Um, if you give me a second, I can pull up the precise to the unit figure, but it's roughly 500, and 500 plus units right now are either approved or um, pending approval. So is anything in construction or it's just on the board? Um, I'll, Tara might be able to do it, but I know they're about to break ground on a, uh, uh, a new project since I received an invitation to go to the virtual groundbreaking. So Tara and might I'll be, be there best too. able so everybody to, uh, Is there anything in construction now that might be um, wrapping up or this is all um, not even groundbreaking yet? We have two buildings under construction, one at Lincoln and Pacific, and then one on 14th Street between Pico and Michigan. And then um, the one that Michael just referred to is breaking ground next week, actually. Yeah, and the Greenway Meadows that opened this week, I found it very um, unusual that there's 39 units there and there's no parking. I don't understand how that got accepted and where those people are going to be parking on 14th street and now they're breaking another one next door to it but i understand they'll have parking right greenway meadows does have some parking not one-to-one -one, but we do have some parking there no they they're saying they're not giving it out and it's only for the people that work there so uh, that's not correct well they're giving a lot of incorrect information out community core. So, and this is all coming from the city list, city housing list. Everything that we're talking about this evening is from the city housing list. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Well, hey, Robert, can I say something real quick? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I had a oh, question. Uh, yeah, but I oh, think oh, yeah, go ahead. Keith. Oh, I'm go. sorry, I didn't see it, Keith. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, and thanks so much for, um, for CRJ for for uh, for putting this on and, and thank you, um, Mayor Hemmelrich and thank you, uh, Mike and thank you, Elena for your uh, your humanity and your professionalism and your passion. I say that unequivocally. Um, so my my question was I, I put in the chat just a recent article uh, from NPR and also within that article is uh, some research from. Um, an academic um, speaking about issues related to uh, infrastructure related eminent domain actions. And so, um, which clearly is a historical eviction practice. Uh, and so I was curious in how might the city's right to return policy kind of utilize precedent and best practices of other municipalities in, in moving forward and in providing new housing for descendants. So I, I do understand that that is, uh, but is a complicated issue. The Housing Commission has actually grappled with it already. We have not. Okay. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, actually, this is something that I would welcome. So, so let me give some background. Um, so at least as it was brought to us and then before it goes to the, um, City Council. Um, the idea is, as uh, Keith said, that for people who either were themselves or our children or our grandchildren and can document that of folks who were displaced from 
you know, Belmar and from the I-10 through city actions in the eminent domain that went on uh, in the 50s and, and 60s would get a preference um, on our uh, affordable housing list in the city. Um, and the question that was, and at least at the Housing Commission, everybody thought that was a good idea. And I would be shocked if it wasn't a seven nothing vote at the city council to do that as well. The, the, the difficult question, which unfortunately, because the Housing Commission has been largely mothballed during COVID. So we heard about it in a meeting and didn't have the luxury of talking about it, thinking about it, and then coming up with a more thoughtful response at a second meeting um, was how do you marry those that preference with the other preferences that the city has? And the city's preferences right now are that if you were um, living in Santa Monica and you were displaced through no fault of your own, which is typically the Ellis Act, sometimes it's owner eviction, owner occupancy eviction, uh, you could get on the list and you would have first preference, the idea of trying to keep people who are here from having to be driven out of the community. And then the second preference is anybody who lives or works in the city. Um, so that includes people who are living in rent burden situations or overcrowding situations or whatever here in the city who need that. And also those low wage workers who, who are doing so much for us. And so the question that we were presented was should the preference for folks who were displaced or our descendants of people who were displaced in the 50s and 60s um, be in that sort of first category um, so that those folks would come ahead of everybody who already lives or works here um, or not. And that was um, in a very limited time we had to do it. It was a very close vote. It was four to three, four people at that time thought, yes, they should get preference over everybody else. And three, which included me, I will say, um, did not think that was the right way to go. Um, and, but I'm, my, my concern is that, um, and we don't know, it could be five people or it could be a thousand people. Um, and we only have so much. I hope we build this 6,000 units, but we don't have that kind of units coming online or the like. My own personal thought at the time was some form, which I've been giving thought to, of trying to give some of those folks preference so that they would not have to wait below all the people who've already signed up who live and work here, which is already probably a few thousand people, that would make no sense either, but some sort of sharing of those opportunities as they come up. But I'm very interested in hearing what people think about that. Um, and I'm particularly interested in hearing what groups like this um, think about it. I think it's a very um, difficult question and it goes to some of what I was talking about before, that once you start trying to redress historical racism, which we absolutely need to address, but then we have to start balancing those things. So, so I actually would, would love to hear from folks here. I've spoken to folks at the Santa Monica Dem Club Diversity Inclusion Committee here, what they think. Um, I hope to speak to <laughs> the Black agenda about this and whatever, not not because I'm the decision maker, because I obviously am not, I'm not elected to anything, but I am involved in several political organizations in the city. And, and when I have to cast my vote of what I think we ought to advocate in front of the city council, I really want to understand what folks think about the right way to balance those preferences. So, so I put that question out to all of you, um, you know, and it's, I think that's now scheduled to come back to council on May 11th is the current date, so there's some time people can think about it, but I would welcome an opportunity to speak with anybody about that to hear, hear people's thoughts about it. Great, we look forward to those conversations at Black Agenda, particularly, and I'm sure CRJ as well. Um, you know, we need to get some resolve to these um, situations uh, regarding housing. Um, we just, we need to get a handle on it, a big handle. Um, not that we're not already doing something, but I'm sure we need to do more. Anyway, if that's it, everybody, guess what time it is? 
So one, it, one little clarification. So sure. I retexted Barbara Schultz and my original answer is correct. The three agencies are LAFLA, Betsetic, and BASTA. Uh, it, it depends on what the income of the person is. Uh, LAFLA and Betsetic are doing the county grant, which would cover anybody at 50% of median or below. LAFLA and BASTA are doing the new Santa Monica grant which would cover the higher income people. Um, and there's also a city of LA grant, which would not affect Santa Monica residents, but would cover LA city residents in the Santa Monica court. But so it is all three agencies doing the representation in, in the Santa Monica court. Okay, thank you, Elena. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, we usually close out our CRJ um, workshops with uh, something inspirational, something strengthening, something that ties us and binds us together. Um, one of our favorite is the Asada Shakur chant, um, which goes something like this. And I'm gonna let you guys decide if you wanna scream or you wanna say it real quiet or you wanna whisper it, but um, it goes like this, uh, it is our duty to fight for freedom and you don't have to say it yet, I'm just gonna tell you what the words are. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. I like to say protect and support, but support one another. Uh, we have nothing to lose but our chains. So I'll say it and you guys say it after me. Everybody turn on their mics, please. Thank you, Elena, for putting it in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. You are you're amazing. I love it when a team comes together. OK, it is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our, it is our duty, duty to fight for freedom. freedom. It is our duty to win. It is, it is our, our duty, duty to win. win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Okay, you guys sound a little lethargic. I'm going to pump it up a little bit. Two more times. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is, it is our, our duty, duty to fight for freedom. freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our, it is our duty to win. win. We must love and support one another. We must, we must love, love and support, support one, another. one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have, we have nothing, nothing to lose, lose but our chains. chains. Okay, Mayor, get used to some letters from um, some of the landlords because I'm about to shout. Okay. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Ashe. Good night, y'all. Yeah. I love, thank, you. I love thank you guys. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Feel better, Elena. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Feel better.